<clears throat> Listen now for the word of God in Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1 and 13 through 25. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You are called to freedom, siblings. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is, is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I'm tired of battles, aren't you? If in the last weeks you've spent any time at all watching television, checking your news feed, listening to the radio, you have probably tired, gotten tired of battles too. I need, as we all do, to take a clear-eyed look at what led American citizens to take up arms on January 6, 2021. So I watch again the scenes of battle. I can't erase from my mind that image of a citizen of our country turning with glee toward the camera to brag that he has turned his American flag into a weapon of war, which he will use to attack a special someone who we have elected to represent us. I can't help but notice that when it comes to guns, we are a nation at war with ourselves. As Congress passes the most significant gun restriction in decades, the Supreme Court rules that citizens have a right to arm themselves in public. And the overturning of Roe v. Wade on Friday is a rallying cry heard around the nation. It is the deafening declaration that a battle which ended in January of 1973 has begun again. I'm tired of battles, aren't you? My spirit is sick and tired of battles. And so I came to Paul's letter to the Galatians hoping to find a word of comfort, some respite from our embattled world, some assurance at least that the battle would not follow us into church this morning. But Paul did not grant me my wish. Instead, he reminded me that we trust the scripture not because it tells us what we want to hear, but because it tells us the truth. And Paul does not mince words. 
He is writing to a Christian community that is itself embattled in conflict over whether or not Christians need to be circumcised as Jewish law dictated. He said no, as we all know, declaring Christians free in Christ. But what struck me as I read his words this time in the America of 2022 is that he describes a kind of battle, an opposition of two powerful forces, the works of the flesh versus the fruits of the spirit. To understand the battle, it is important for us to note that the flesh for Paul is not the skin and it is not even the physical body. When Paul talks about the flesh, he is referring more to what we might describe as self-centeredness. And that is not only making one's pleasure an ultimate value. It is also placing extensions of the self at the center of our identity, of our worldview, of our decision-making. It is then all about my family, my race, my party, my religious or non-religious values. The flesh is at work when we split the moral universe into us and them. We are right and righteous, and they are wrong and evil. Understanding flesh in that broader way allows us to see why Paul includes in his list the very things that we are encountering in such abundance today. Idolatry, making a god of self, uncritical allegiance to a person, a value, or a party. Enmities, that is active acts of hostility, dissensions, factions, and things like these. In essence, Paul is describing the things that lead us into battle against one another. They are the things that tore communities apart in Paul's day and that are tearing us apart today. And because Paul is speaking to the divided church in Galatia, we cannot sidestep the truth that these divisions are found not only in our country, but within the church. If you have ever had occasion to say, oh wait, but I, but we are not those kinds of Christians, you know exactly what I mean. We who bear the name of Christ are divided too often along party lines, as if God is clearly and consistently rooting for our political team, or worse, that everything we do because we do it must be divinely inspired. Oh, Paul and I and you, I would guess, are all tired of the battles in our country, in the church, in our own hearts. So, what is a Christian to do? What is a congregation to do? Should we retreat from the battle, simply ignoring the news, declaring that political upheavals or national divisions are no concern of God's and should not be mentioned in church? Should we take the stance that what happens between God and me or between Jesus and me is strictly private, divorced from the public sphere? Or should we keep listening to God and to scripture, trusting that there we will find the truth we need to hear? You won't be surprised to hear that I vote for the latter. Paul clearly has something more he wants the Galatians and us to hear. Interestingly, he does not say, as Christians, you should not take sides, or in order to avoid dissension, the answer is neutrality. Such advice would run contrary to the whole scripture, which calls us to take action, to create communities that welcome the stranger, feed the hungry, defend those who are poor or oppressed. So Paul is not asking the Galatians or us not to have a point of view, a policy preference, or even a set of political commitments. If you've noticed, Paul himself is not known to be a waffler, 
and he clearly tells the Galatians which side he took in the circumcision argument that was tearing the Galatian church apart. So no, neutrality is not the biblical, not the Christian answer. Then what is? Paul is asking the Galatians and us to do something that is far more radical than taking a side in an ongoing battle, though we well may be called to do that too. What he is asking us is to refuse to let the battle shape who we are. He is asking us to resist the impulse to simply slap a party label on individuals and policies and then feel justified to simply write them off if the label does not match our own. The spirit of enmity, of hatred, and the demonization of the other thrives when we do that, when we allow ourselves to be convinced that our society is a battlefield and that in order to survive, in order for our values to win the day, we must remain on high alert, quickly and efficiently perceiving who is friend and who is foe. No, Paul says, that is not what I want for you, my Christian friends. That is the way of the flesh. Instead, do this. Consent to allowing yourselves to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. By contrast to the works of the flesh, Paul writes, the fruit, and that is the natural consequence of living in the presence of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. So what would it mean for those of us in United Christian Church to be guided by the Spirit in these battle-torn days? What is our distinctly Christian calling? I have two ideas that you might consider. One, we might want to question the common wisdom that convinces us that, we, that what we are engaged in in our society is strictly a partisan battle. Republicans versus Democrats, red states versus blue states, conservative versus liberal Christians. We who consent to be guided by the Holy Spirit might do well to ask a different question of people and policies. Not are they Republicans or Democrats, not are they our kinds of Christian or another kind of Christian, not whether they are us or them, but instead simply this. Do we see in them signs of the divine presence, the Holy Spirit at work? Do their attitudes or actions or policies have the potential to further the cause of love and peace in the world, period? I believe that that would be a radical act. It would be a reminder to ourselves that we are Christian first and foremost, and that our primary loyalty is to serve the God of love. Asking simply whether a person or policy serves that cause also allows us to look past the party labels and acknowledge this truth. What we want to see in the world is not really, not ultimately the victory of our party. What we want really to see in the depths of our being, in our spirits, is a society where love and peace and joy flourish. 
does this person, does this policy or law, whichever party supports it, further that flourishing? Then regardless of who proposes it, who gets credit for it? Count us in. And two, if we truly want to be guided by the Spirit, we need to notice where the Spirit is already at work, not only in people and policies, but in our own lives. The Spirit is present in our lives already, guiding us away from hatred into love, away from hostility and toward peace. So we might consider making it a practice to look around and notice where we see the spirit at work. Perhaps it's even in the sustaining bond of love that we feel with a family member or a friend in the face of our deep political disagreements. Notice the places where love and peace and joy and gentleness seem to thrive. For me, this congregation is one of those places and being here refreshes my spirit. Pay attention to every gentle word you hear spoken, every act of patience and kindness you witness. And remember, the Holy Spirit is at work in strong and steady opposition to the powers of hatred and division that seem to engulf us. And we who are Christians are called and privileged to follow the Spirit's lead. And you know what? When I remember that, I feel far less tired. I am refreshed by the presence of the Holy Spirit, granting me and all of us the gifts of self-control gentleness, faithfulness, generosity, kindness, patience, peace, joy, and love. And what could be a more powerful antidote to the discord around us than that? Amen.